I mean, the most exciting thing for a world premiere is that it hasn't been done. When I first started working with James on this opera, there was this question of how do you infuse ancient Greece into the Victorian era and then build this world. As designers, as our whole team, we're looking at how do we create a world on stage that feels like a dream. Inside of your dreams, things that in our real life wouldn't make sense, things that would seem maybe intangible or incongruous that wouldn't really line up, in dream space, those things always work. So for the designers, that was looking at the music and the score, and so looking at the way it's orchestrated, looking at some of the sounds in that. The designers and I then talked about how do all of our design choices feel like the music. As I'm drawing, I'm constantly trying to channel who these characters are. And then the greatest joy is once the silhouette is created and that the director is like, yes, this is working. I can see this moving in the wind or it makes them larger than life. Then I can start throwing the paint on it. And that is, that's when, I feel that's when the magic really happens. We started at the very beginning thinking of ways to incorporate color and light and shadow as actual like narrative arcs in the piece. That light tells a story, that you could watch the entire production on mute and not hear any of the music and light would still tell you a story. Light still gives you information. And where we landed was really incorporating the, the idea of these Victorian street lamps, these street scenes. There's a lot of juxtaposition of interior and exterior in the opera. And so we kind of created a set that feels like both at once. And these lights then are programmable to undulate like the music, that all the lights can take different programming and move and different flickering shadows and light glows kind of feel like they're following some of the story or activated by certain characters. We've designed the projections to also kind of react to the characters. So Dionysus at one point um, assimilates into Victorian London and has a printed suit and that suit bleeds out onto the walls. The pattern can spread and take over the walls. So there is this surrealist kind of going to our dream and our nightmare. It's like the whole wall can suddenly have the print of his costume and he almost disappears into it and emerges from that when he wants. We wanted to create something that felt um, like it was always shifting, you know, that we should never feel like we know exactly what to expect. What elevates the drama of the, of the text and the music in the costumes is when they're a little bit larger than life, when they take up a little bit more space than they should. The skirts are a little bit longer, the hemlines are a little exaggerated, when we have capes, they are voluminous. In the choices for the fabrics in Lord of Cries, what we're doing is we're elevating and heightening the reality of who these characters are. The colors are a little bit more richer. We're also doing a lot of layering of shears where you sort of see the figure and you don't see the figure. Instead of just a crown on Dionysus' head, it's going to be that his whole face is surrounded with metallic, unusual objects to frame and to shine light up into uh, Anthony's face. Opera is so special to me because it's a, a platform that I feel like I'm embraced as an artist or as a painter. And I get to paint the costumes on stage. For me, what makes opera special is 
It occupies a space that not only is combining a lot of art forms, but in the performance of an opera, you are illuminating part of how we all exist and feel in our lives and, and the things that we hope for, or we dream about, the things that we yearn for, those are given literal voice in an opera in a way that is almost unable to define. And when it happens well, you are completely enraptured and overwhelmed by it.